mechanical and aeronautical engineer, renowned for his work on the design and development of the RB211 and the Trent family of engines. Having joined Rolls-Royce as a graduate apprentice from Bristol University, he rose to become Director of Engineering and Technology and a main board member. Throughout his career, he has won numerous awards, including the Prince Philip uh, Medal, which is a Royal Academy of Engineering Award, the Royal Aeronautical Society's Gold Medal, and the Royal Academy of Engineering's Mike Robert Award, which is a premier award for innovation. He was made a commander of the British Empire in 2001, is a fellow of the Royal Society, a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, an honorary fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society, and a fellow of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. As you may know, he's published a book on the RB211, History of the RB211, and has kindly brought a few along for sale. And they're at the back of the room. Uh, you can have a look at them and you can uh, buy them, please. I'm looking forward to uh, what should be a very interesting talk. And I would like to welcome Phil tonight to Kellam Island Museum. Phil has also agreed to answer any questions that you may have at the end of the talk. So over to you, uh, Phil. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for inviting me. It's, uh, I must say, it does look an interesting place, and maybe a few minutes afterwards, we can all walk around, I don't know. Um, the story of the RB211 really starts at around about uh, 1960, um, when the company decided that it needed a new large engine to replace the Pompe shown there in the center. Um, and that engine was given the designation RB178, because you'll see some pictures coming up with 178 on them. Um, at that time, the, the Conway was fitted to the um, uh, Boeing 707 and Douglas DC-8. Uh, for a short period of time, it was the better engine on the aeroplane because Pratt and Whitney were, were um, the only other engine on the aeroplanes was a uh, pure jet and Conway was a bypass engine. But Pratt very quickly then developed a bypass engine which displaced the Conway. And unfortunately, the sales of Conways then, uh, there really weren't any more. Um, the, the other engines at that time in production were the Dart and the Viscount, which was a very successful engine, still in production right up until 1987 with about 7,000 engines sold, but it was quite small and therefore got a very big uh, revenue out of it. Um, the Avon, which is essentially a military engine, but it was in the Comet 4 and also the Caravelle. <coughs> Again, limited sales. Um, the tie in the Bangar, that was a big mistake by um, uh, the Vickers at the time, who decided they wanted a turboprop and not a turbofan engine, and, and consequently the sales were very, very relatively small. The Spade manufactured for the Triton, and again in the Triton and the BNC 111, which it was originally selected for didn't sell well. And this was because at that point in time, they were all government owned and Rolls-Royce had to do what the government and the airlines wanted. And the airlines didn't focus on the world market, they focused on their own domestic markets. And so we finished up developing an engine that was essentially too small for the, for the civil market. Although the Spey went on to become a very successful engine. Um, and then, so, really something new had to be done otherwise you could see that by the end of that decade um, the, the production program will be driving to a ball. The early studies started in one, 1961 and I've just shown here two examples of engines that were studied. Um, the top is a spade type configuration where there's the low pressure compressor driven by a two-stage turbine, a high pressure compressor driven by a two-stage turbine, and a bypass ratio around about just a bit above one, I think. 
and, the, it's, and that was essentially the same configuration as the spy. And then the, the other alternative was the Conway configuration, where you've got the, an intermediate compressor on the same shaft, uh, fewer HP compressor stages, a single stage turbine, and a four stage HP turbine. So in total, I think the number of turbine stages was the same. But, um, and when they did the comparisons, there really wasn't a great deal to choose. The other engine that was drawn at the time is the three shaft engine, but you'll notice this is a much higher bypass ratio. Um, uh, three stages of fan, an intermediate compressor, a high pressure compressor, each driven by their own turbine, a rather strange looking combustion chamber. Um, but that was really, it was concluded that all the time that the, the optimum bypass ratio, as it was seen then, was around about two. This engine really only came into its own, or this configuration really only came into its own when the bypass ratio uh, got above three, three and a half, four. And those studies went on for a while. But at the same time, there was um, the aircraft situation. There really weren't any major new aircraft projects on the drawing boards. Um, uh, Vickers were looking at a stretched VC-10. The European aircraft manufacturers were starting to get together to, what, to form what became Airbus. Uh, in the United States, Boeing and McDonnell Douglas were concentrating on supersonic transports. So there really wasn't anybody looking seriously at new civil engines. The other main program that was going on though was the uh, heavy lift transport in the United States for what became the um, Galaxy. Uh, and there was a demonstrator program running, which Pratt Whitney had an engine of this configuration, two stage fan, several stages of compressor, two stages of turbine. GE had also a two stage fan, uh, several stages of compressor. And uh, again, five stages of turbine. But you'll notice both of them had two stage fans, despite the fact the bypass ratio was high. And that was because the technology had not yet been demonstrated to do that duty in a single stage. Um, they were, however, using fewer compressor stages than Rolls was projecting at that point in time, because again, the compressor technology had not advanced very much compared to the previous generation. The one that really was a surprise was the the GE engine, which was running very much hotter than any temperatures that we can consider in, and also significantly higher by frustration. This was now in 1964, 1965. Meanwhile, Rolls-Royce had worked up its studies to a point where it defined an engine, the 178-14. Um, this is its configuration, a three-stage fan, four-stage booster compressor, the six stage, seven stage high pressure compressor and four stage turbine, five stage turbine, uh, one HP and four LP. Uh, the thrust compared to a Conway was 27,500. Specific fuel consumption was 12.5% better, barely enough to justify launching a new engine. Pressure ratio got up from 17 to 20. Bypass ratio from 0.6 to 2.3. Turbulent temperature from 1275 to 1400 K. 17, 14 compressor stations instead of 17, five turbine stations instead of three. Weight a bit higher, but the specific weight was down quite a bit from 0.26 to 0.16. The length was substantially shorter, and the diameter was up from 45, this is the fan diameter, 45 to 62 inches. And that engine, was then run as a demonstrator engine. And was frankly was a bit of a disaster. Um, the, it, it, was, it was very difficult to accelerate at all. It would surge because there were problems in matching the compressors. But more importantly, the hot section was in a very poor shape. This is the combustion liner, the air coming at the front, going into the turbine there. This is a thermal paint test where you can see the, the, the um, 
contours on here, and I think in one or two cases you can see where a hole was burnt through. Mm -hmm. The nozzle guide vane here burns at the trading edge there, and it only run for a few hours under these conditions. It did eventually achieve the design thrust of 27,500 pounds of thrust. Sorry, it only achieved 24,500 pounds, 25,000 pounds of thrust a determined entry temperature of 1425 Kelvin. Now, the writing was on the wall that we hadn't got the high temperature technology necessary to develop a new engine. And I'm sorry to say that, that we should then have invested far more, but money was short, the program got stopped, and what we should have done was continued it and sorted some of these problems out. And, and that was a lost opportunity. Then, during 1965, things really started to change. The Lockheed C5A heavy lift transport engine was announced, powered by the GETF 39. It had a bypass ratio of eight when we were debating in Europe lifetime rate bypass ratios of two. Um, and that caught everybody, including for that matter, Pratt and Whitney, by surprise. At the same time, Pan Am asked Boeing for a new aircraft, two and a half times larger than the 707, which became the uh, Boeing 747. And, they, and they, they, they saw that the C5A, or the demonstrator program that had preceded the C5A, uh, had provided the basis for a new engine. Um, Rolls-Royce decided to offer um, a new engine, the 178-51, which was the three-shaft engine, and Pratt and Whitney, but Pratt and Whitney was selected in April 1966. I, I think we're not, we're not surprised that we, we lost that, but it was our first attempt to actually get into the American market. And it was important that we got into the American market because the, you can see the problems that happened if we followed the European manufacturers historically. Um, they, they never accessed the, the market. And this is the engine that was offered. Um, single stage fans, I know we've done some testing of single stage fans and convinced ourselves we could do it. Um, six stage compressor for the IP and then again six stages for the HP. Single stage turbine driving the HP turbine, single stage turbine driving the IP compressor, sorry, HP compressor. And then a three stage turbine, four stage turbine driving the fan. It was argued at the time, and I think the justification that it had the optimum aerodynamics. It was a short and rigid engine, and this became quite important as time went on. It was one of the, all, by necessity, one of the things that you could get with a two shaft engine is you have to put more structures across the, the, the engine to support the bearings. Consequence of that is it's a lot stiffer and therefore keeps the engine a lot rounder. And that became quite important when we got into service with um, reduced, minimizing deterioration because clearances didn't open up as much. Improved operation, that was because it didn't need variables. Um, so it, it would handle quite well because the compressors automatically match themselves as you pull the throttle back. Better growth potential, again, well proven subsequently, because you could grow the engine in one of two ways, and we did both. You could just put a bigger fan on without affecting the rest, or you could uh, increase the pressure ratio of the IP compressor to get more flow through, and both were used during the subsequent development. Whereas on, a, on the two shaft engine, if you change the fan, you have to do a new booster compressor or if you change the booster compressor, um, you, you, you start loading the servers up. And because of the stiffness of the structure, it had good performance potential. These were the arguments used in the marketing at the time, and I think it turned out to be factual when the real engine went into service. Then we lost the 747 competition, but in March 66, American Airlines issued a requirement for a new 265 seat short medium range aircraft, uh, which became the uh, TriStar and DC 10. 
And at the same time, the Airbus Consortium was forming in Europe and to launch what became the A300 engine, the A300 aeroplane. And as I say, Lockheed and McDonald Douglas studied them. Uh, we offered the engine called the RB207, which was a scale up of the 178-51. The 178-51 was 43,000 pounds and they needed 50, so we just scaled it up a little bit. Um, to all three aircraft manufacturers, that was Lockheed, McDonnell Douglas and Airbus. I was also worried that we might win more than one. <laughs> we had a big problem on our hands. Then in November 1966, Lockheed in particular considered a trijet. The reason being that the twin engine aeroplane uh, in a single engine out case over the Rockies was it was difficult. You had to have a very big engine to get over the rockets, and so they concluded that the trijet would be a, a better uh, solution. Um, and McDonnell Douglas rapidly followed suit. So that now left us with the big engine for the Airbus and the smaller engine for the McDonnell Douglas and Lockheed. And the smaller engine was the, at that time, the 2006. At 33,260 pounds, just remember that number, um, which was scaled from the 207. Um, and then in July 67, TWA selected the Trijet, and Mark, 60, Mark 68, Lockheed, announced the launch of the TriStar, pied by the 2.0, that's 22, but not at 33,000 pounds of thrust, it was now at 40,000 pounds of thrust, which we had to get out of the same basic design was the 33 that the engine was designed for. Some of you may remember this, it was in the press, it was announced in the House of Commons, uh, marvellous achievement that Rolls Royce had launched this, this engine. Jack from what was from the US, it was for 500 engines, I think it was about 50 aircraft uh, from Eastern 44 from TWA. Uh, with spares for so just over 500 engines. And uh, Denny Pearson and Hardy both got knighthoods as a result. Um, all right. So, um, just to recap, the 06 was 32,000 pounds of thrust. Uh, 32 is 40,600. As the program proceeded, the engine got heavier, and so did the aeroplane. And so we then had to commit to upgrading it still further to 42,000 pounds of thrust, which is an enormous growth from the design. And this was without essentially changing the, the overall dimensions of the engine. The advance relative to the Conway was nearly double the thrust. 21% better fuel consumption, 150 degree turbinetric temperature increase, pressure ratio from 25 compared to 17, fan diameter now almost double, specific weight 10% less. An enormous task. <clears throat> this shows some of the features that were built into the design. Um, firstly, the fan at the front. The company during the 1960s had done a lot of work on composite materials for lift jet engines. If you may remember, VTR was all the range during the 1960s, it was the way all military aircraft were going to be. And the engineering director at the time concluded he could use that technology for the civil engines. So the, the fan, the high field fan, that's carbon fiber fan there. Carbon fiber in the status, carbon fiber, fiber, outer guy vein, um, and then an aluminium fan case, free vortex compressors. The, the whole philosophy of aerodynamic designs of compressors have changed in this three or four year period. Free vortex compressors there. It was mounted from the core because that was deemed at the time to be the lighter solution. The front bag housing here was in composite material. The 
drums were electronically welded the first time that that had been recorded. Um, an annual combustor there with air spray fuel boxes, again new. The HP turbine was another difficulty. The American manufacturers had focused their attention on using cast turbine blades, and there was a very strong view held by the laboratory that you couldn't guarantee to get rid of the porosity out of cast blades. So Rolls Royce went down what turned out to be a blind alley, which was a two piece blade. This was a mnemonic blade in now mnemonic 115, which is a higher temperature alloy, but made in two pieces and braced together. And the reason you wanted to do that is so that you could put much more complicated cooling configurations internally. The air in this blade came up there, it hinged through the leading edge, over the top, and then out the trailing edge. Yeah, it came up there, it hinged through there, and out the trailing edge. Um, but they had enormous difficulty in making it. So the very early engines we had to run with a standard Nomonic 105 extruded blade, similar to that used on the Conway and the Spade, which really hadn't got the temperature capability. And we struggled on trying to get this blade to work, but never did, so it was canceled. Um, so we went there with this engine running very hot with a turbine that was completely incapable of dealing with the temperature. Um, the LP turbine, though, did have hollow cast turbine blades um, and actually turned out to be very successful. We ran the first engine on time at uh, the end of August uh, 1968, and I remember it well. It took us a week to start it. <laughs> Not because of the engine, but because of the Lucas fuel system, which kept on breaking as we cr cranked it. But we eventually, so we put a Conway fuel system on it and started it with a Conway fuel system, which is essentially just a tap, <laughs> running up and down on a tap. Um, and then we run three engines, and the my boss at that time, who was running the development team, said, look, this engine's a load of rubbish. We're going to run some cyclic endurance just to demonstrate to the organization how bad it is. We knew it was going to fail, but the organization really wasn't focused. And this is the engine on the street. It had only run Yes, it had only run 29 hours at 1425. We had to type test with, the, with these high thrusts at 1550. So this is 125 degrees cooler than we actually had to get to. And we had to do 150 hours, but not 29 hours. Um, you can see what happened. There's the turbine blade, the tips are missing there. Um, this is the combustion chamber, what's left of it. There's the nozzle guide vein that's burnt through. Um, and uh, likewise. So the hot section was in deep trouble. But not, that wasn't the only thing, the high fuel fan was also in trouble. And we'd also had a number of failures of the composites at the front of the engine. Um, and uh, we had a compressor casing that burst, and there oh, are so many I would be here all night if I went through them all. So and there was a change in design, a new designer came in, John Coplin, who then essentially redesigned the engine. Uh, and this is, these are the changes. Still had the high fuel fan, still had the high fuel fan. But the composite, all the composites were taken out. The um, steel fell out the guide vanes and the, uh, the stiff structure here. Um, titanium, aluminium compressor case and stators. Uh, steel front bearing housing. But also at that time, Lockheed came along and said, "Look." We would like you to mount the engine from the on, on the fan case and not the core, because we think we can now do a lighter pylon. Um, and regrettably, we agreed. And so the uh, gearbox was moved from here out here, and the mount 
front of that was there and the rear valve there, so the valve was moved from there out to there. That required putting in some flying drive in to come to the external gearbox, which otherwise would sit behind the engine there. Um, although that turned out to be quite a good thing in a way, that the maintenance was, was very good. Our competitor engines had the gearbox here, and it was very difficult to get in and do any maintenance on it. So that wasn't such a bad move, and we did have some reliability problems with it. There were a number of changes to the air system as well because the performance was pretty bad. Um, redesign of the drums and some other changes in there. Quite a lot of redesign. And this was the definitive Dash 22 engine, engine 12. We'd had 11 engines prior to that, which were either 21106 or hybrids. Now, the high fuel fan. Well, it offered 300 pound weight saving and a 2% fuel consumption benefit, which was a big prize. It was recognized as a high risk, and so we'd always had a titanium backup program, um, although there were never quite as many titanium blades as we wanted. Um, the BC10 service trial at Highfield showed sensitivity to herd and grip, and the blades, the develop, early development blades, were prone to that delamination, as you can see in this picture. Um, and because we had titanium blades as well, we, we could do a lot of the development running this titanium blade. And it was replaced ultimately by the, the hyper blade, in, in, by the titanium blade in spring 1970. And the thing that really was the final decider was this engine. It was a, an engine that was running out in open air doing crosswind tests. And there was an almighty failure of the fan, and it was never fully established what the primary cause was. We suspect it was the high fill blades failing at the root. But the, the blades came off and lost the whole of the front end of the engine. Um, the intermediate casing here is, you can see it there, is, is, is split in two. And I remember the engine coming back. The only thing that was holding the front engine of the engine to the back end of the engine was the shaft that went up the middle. <laughs> it literally was in two pieces. You could just do that with it. And it was pulled away, hidden from sight for some while. Um, so at that point in time, it was decided we had to go to a titanium blade. However, despite all of that, we got the engine into the air in the BC-10 in March 1970. It flew for an hour and 11 minutes, not far from here out of Hutton, right over the M1. And uh, the first flight of the TriStar took place in two hours, 25 minutes. Now, I, I remember this, for both events particularly, this one, um, we had some problems with the combustion chamber. Uh, which we just managed to cobble up to be sufficient to carry out the first flight. And also we only had one set of titanium blades. So we had to run the development engine first to establish that it was fit to fly. And then the same set was put on the flight engine for the first flight, which is a bit questionable, I have to say. <laughs> um, then when it came to the first flight of the TriStar, um, that, the first flight was fairly straightforward, it's two hours, 25 minutes. A number of people, I, unfortunately I wasn't one of them, a number of people went over to see it fly. And, uh, my boss was there and he said, I was sitting at the end of the runway, at the side of the runway and there was the aircraft there. And I think a, um, a chase plane had just flown across before. He said he saw this engine, this aircraft rolling down the runway. And he said it was so quiet, I thought we'd already had an engine shut down, but it was actually the high fly pass ratio engine. And it took off and it succeeded in two hours. Now, another major problem was the HP turbine. Um, both the nozzle guide bay and the turbine bay. On the nozzle guide bay, we went through a number of iterations and eventually finished up with um, these two designs. When the engine Yes, after the bankruptcy, we renegotiated the contract with Lockheed and they agreed to take a derated engine 
um, some six months after the original promise date, and then the fully rated engine a year later. The derated engine is the 22C, and the fully rated engine is the 22B. Um, this was the standard nozzle dive in the 22C. We redesigned the tube, we put a lot more cooling features internally, some field cooling at the trailing edge, but it was still prone to burning at the leading edge. Um, so we went to the 22B, we reduced the number of mains from 54 to 36. And one of the reasons, there are two reasons for it. One, you get better aerodynamics on the nozzle guide vanes, but the other is we had 18 fuel nozzles. So if you plot the fuel nozzles to be in line with the holes, 18 of the 16, but then the hot spot went between the nozzle guide vanes instead of hitting the leading edge. And that worked quite well. Um, and also by then we introduced film cooling, we got higher pressure feed into it, much more film cooling. And that vein thereafter did pretty well. As I'll show you in a minute, performance was also a problem. Um, and we introduced a number of sealed features, uh, particularly the HP uh, which was very inefficient early on. A number of sealed features here, uh, double sided seal there, a caudal seal, and the caudal seal, because the nozzle guide vein rocks uh, under the gas loads, if you make it a make the platform a series of cords, then it will rock on a straight line and seal. Whereas if it's an arc, mm -hmm. it picks up at the core and opens up a leaf in the middle. Um, and, and that was also quite successful and became a design feature of all subsequent engines. Um, the turbine blade, uh, again, had a number of problems. Uh, it was never, uh, the temperature capability was never going to be good enough, but it also suffered from vibration problems. And it was very difficult in those days to determine what the primary course was because you could only put six strain gauges onto a turbine with the lean out equipment wasn't good enough for anything else. By the time you run the engine, you probably lost four of those because they failed. And so you had very little data on which to go. But we concluded that the primary cause of the uh, vibration was the upstream pressure field from the IP nozzle dive vane. There were 26 vanes and they were, the blade was vibrating in second flat mode. Um, and so fairly late in the program, we increased the length of the engine by 0.325, uh, which meant linking all the pipes, putting spaces in, so on and so forth, to increase that gap. But that pretty well fixed the problem. Performance. <laughs> this chart shows the blue is the actual thrust achieved on the test bed. So the very first engine got up to 16,000 pounds of thrust. The red is the calculated thrust if we were to run it at 1442, it failed before we got to 1442. Um, so you can see we were right down here, and that's the same all the way through. Um, the first two engine is engine 13. So there was a significant improvement over the other ones, but you can see the thrust of uh, tight temperature is only 32,000 or so, not sufficient to complete the flight test program. And we didn't improve as that. Um, these were the first flight engines, those. Uh, that was the first flight engines. Then the first production engine, supposedly, was that still only producing 34, 35,000 pounds of thrust. And so it was decided that we, and I was given this job, um, we had to build a demonstrator engine where we put everything we knew in to improve the performance in order to um, uh, demonstrate to ourselves and everybody else that we could actually achieve the performance. And that, the engine that ran that was 10,011, which was up to about 36,000 pounds of thrust. It actually achieved over 42. And that was sufficient to complete the flight test program, but not quite good enough to go into service. Mm -hmm. And so all flight engines have been delivered, and there were a large number of them, uh, were all upgraded to that standard. 
and that was a third second build. And then, so the, the first, the upgraded flight engines were then there, and then the batch five flight engines there, and 22C production engine there, and then later on, 22B engines. Now, that particular test occurred on February the 3rd, 1971, on 10,000 the company went into receivership on February the 4th. Mm. And uh, I was on the test bed that evening, and that is me with, with uh, the engineering director at the time. And there was an enormous interest in the test result, and uh, the, uh, we were sending stuff down to the head office in London, because the board meet, it was the board meeting the next day that decided that we could take the company into receivership. So it was too late to stop the company going into receivership. But had it not occurred, I think the program would have been cancelled. So it was that close. Um, and that, that's, a, that, that's to our engineers, that, uh, performance engineers, that did the test results. <clears throat> so why did the company go into receivership? Well, this tells it. The, Profit plan that was drawn up at the start of the program. The launch cost was 88 million pounds. The least of the pool was 71 pounds. And the RMB was 69 of that. And that increased progressively until just in, in 1971, the launch cost was 197, that's what. Um, Two and a half times as many for that, and the R and D earned for that was 166. So predominantly, it was the R and D cost that went up. Same time, the production cost, the profit plan assumed, no, the profit plan assumed a production cost of 632,000 pounds for the basic engine, 90,000. Oh, I keep talking about that. 90,000 for the pod, uh, but of course there are only two pods because the descent engines are coming from, so the propulsion system cost is so much for the engine. That escalated such that at the time we received the bankruptcy, it was up at 1.1 million. Um, significantly above, above the actual selling price. So a price was renegotiated with Lockheed. Uh, in order to accommodate that increase in cost. And so the program continued from, from February the 4th, 1971, until we went into service in April 1972. The progress that was made was absolutely astronomical. I, I don't think it's ever been that since. So Stanley Hooker, who was at the time technical director, said the only uh, time he can remember in his career that it was equal to was when they were developing the moon in the Second World War. Um, we upgraded the flight engine three times in 12 months. 3,000 hours of bench running were increased in 12 months, um, whereas we were doing less than 1,000 hours a year before that. 450 hour type tests completed between January and April, it's in four months. And that takes you typically it's two weeks to run the test, and the time you've. So, so it's. That's assuming you're on 24 hours a day. Uh, type approval was achieved in February 72, uh, but it was 8% derated because it's the best of the CC. And a year later, we achieved type approval for the 22B, 1973. So we managed to get into service. It was actually four and a half months later than the negotiated contract was six months later. And this shows you the, some of the, that's the combustion chamber. You remember that combustion chamber we saw earlier? Well, that's the safety combustion chamber now. At least it's all there. <coughs> Lots of guided veins in pretty good condition. Turbine blade with just a little bit of oxidation there. But um, not bad, but as you'll see in a minute, not good enough. Now in that, more or less in that 12 month period, these were some of the major design changes that were introduced. Um, because we've gone to the titanium fan, we had to do a completely new uh, um, containment system. 
And we hadn't actually demonstrated the ability to contain, so it wasn't just a development program, it was a technology program and a development program to get the containment system on. It was established during some of the design analysis that had that bearing failed, an overheat of the shaft, we could have a fan shaft failure, which would let the fan come out the front. So a second shaft was put in to avoid that happening, third safe shaft. We'd also continue to devise the aerodynamics through the compressor and to strengthen the cylinders. The HP compressor casing on the old design was a a braised construction of stages <clears throat> and it, it used to go out round, but you couldn't keep it around. It wasn't even round when it was new. So that was all replaced by a, uh, a completely new compressor case and a new construction with T slotted stages. Um, another problem we had with performance was the, the turbine blade moves rearwards determined by the temperature. The stator, which it was engaging with, was determined by the temperature of the cold casing at the outside. So the turbine blade would march rearwards and the seal would come out of engagement, so we used to get a lot of leakage over the top. And, it, and because of the hade, it had moved so far, it was very difficult just to correct it by uh, adjusting the seal. So um, it was decided to change the location. The engine had a, a, both an inner and an outer combustion casing. And the stator, the st static seal member, originally was lo located off that cold outer casing. Well, that was switched around such that it was now located off the inner casing, which was located at the front here. And that grew a lot further, so that the stator followed the rotor. More, not, not exactly, but it was much closer. And that made the seal of the turbine very much better. Um, we had a number of changes as we started running at poor conditions. Uh, sorry. That's it, thank you, back, thanks. You can say that. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone speak out of my head. Um, where was I? Yes, here. Yeah. Um, when we started running uh, at full pressure, the inner combustion casing started expanding and, and yielded, and had we continued, it would have actually burst. So a very quick and neat uh, design change was made where the wire rat, you can see there and there, that was a bit like gun barrels, wire, wrap wire around it to hold it in, and that worked extremely well and in fact stayed in production for many years. Um, and also there were other problems with the crap. Uh, with the cracking of the um, combustion, combustion head and there were stiffening rings were on for that purpose as well. Um, that's on that pair shape fast. Yeah, the, this joint, which didn't have a disc in it, was centric, was growing outwards and, and over stress and had to put a disc in there to hold it. This is the joint between the turbine and the compressor. Um, what else? Oh, the air system was changed quite a lot. Yes, another important development was the afterbody. We had a, a what was known as a, a 14 degree afterbody on the engine. This is the body the, between the aircraft and the engine wing. And that was producing more drag than ideal. And our people, our own people, concluded, not lucky, that if we changed the angle to 11 degrees, we could reduce the drag. And that made a significant improvement to the uh, a significant improvement to the uh, aircraft performance. And later on, we actually used a further advance in the afterbody and a 14, uh, 15 degree afterbody, 
And at that point in time, Lockheed agreed that we had met the full performance specification. Um, and there are a whole host of other changes in reserve. It's stiffened down in heads and pounds, and it's about collapsed at one stage. Increased capacity turbines, that was part of the performance to get more airflow through the engine. And thickened stages because the traction was a bit thin. All of those changes which were pretty well introduced in such a 12 month period. It's quite remarkable. Now, we went into service. Surprise, surprise, it wasn't very reliable. This shows, firstly, the shock visit rate against years in service. So you see the turn end up here at 1.4. That's roughly every 600 hours the engine was going in the shock. Um, the Pratt Whitney engine, which is on the 747, a much longer stage length, was a bit better, but not very good. And CF6, which is quite a bit better, was like that. CF6 and the two of them were written there. Yeah. If you put that same thing on a flight basis, then you see the JT9 in the 747 sticks out like a sore thumb. The 22 b is still not quite as good as the CF6, but not so bad, but they were all pretty awful. Um, and this shows the progression that was made over the following 12 years. And you eventually got down to an acceptable rate um, down here. Now you'd be pretty close to zero. You know, the engines last for 20,000 hours, which is. Um, yeah. Right, we've been in service uh, eight, nine months. It was Christmas 1972, 20th December. And we had a fan disc failure. It was an Eastern Airlines failure. Um, and shortly afterwards, then second failure was TWA um, over the Rockies. And so the whole the enormous level of activity took place. And the some very clever analysis of the uh, materials in the manufacturing process showed that an A disc is a disc um, taken from the top of the billet, and the B disc is a disc taken from the bottom of the billet. And it, it was demonstrated that A discs were showing indications on inspection uh, at quite low lives. 338 drives or 379 drives, those are the two that fail, and the other ones were all quite low. And the B discs, except for that one, uh, were quite better, quite a lot better. So a, um, a life limit of 150 flights was put on. So we had to replace all the engines every 150, all the discs every 150 flights. I don't know anything about that. Now, what was the fall of the failure? There, there were really two parts asking the problem. The first was that we had chosen to set a, a material titanium uh, 685, which was a new development with IMI. And it turned out it had an un undesirable characteristic if it was made in large billets like this, that if you took it up to stress and then came down, up and down, straight up and down, the life was fine. And that's how all of our testing had been done. But if you take it up to stress, hold it for 30 seconds or a minute or so, and then go down, the life falls away dramatically. And that was the problem. Well, that was one part of the problem. The other part of the problem was we were actually getting inclusion at the top of the billet. And um, so the combination of those two led to this problem. So very rapidly, um, very rapidly, uh, the disc was replaced by a 6-4 titanium disc, which is what the competitors were using, in which it was well established. Um, and I think in, in about 15 months, we had reworked the whole fleet. And actually got a lot of credit for the airlines as to how well we supported them. So I didn't think there was, during that, any serious disruption to the flight operation. The next problem, one that was very close to my heart, because they seemed to, seemed to get all the difficult problems. Um, was takeoff surge. You'd be going down the runway, just at rotation, the engine would surge. Sometimes it recovered, sometimes it was an abort takeoff, sometimes it was an in-flight shutdown. But, uh, and that 
shows against time cumulative surge removals by that was in well, by January 1976, but originally fixed it, we had 140 removals per surge. And when we got in the shop, we were able to sort out what the problem was. As I say, so it's either just before or after our confrontation. Reworked engines has been through the fit, fitting shop were worse than new. Center engine position was worse than the uh, side ones, particularly in bad weather because snow used to go down the intake and that didn't really do it. Um, as an interim, we introduced a warm-up procedure where the, the, the pilot had to sit at the end of the runway and run the engine for, um, I think it was a minute at 60% uh, fan speed to warm the engine up before he actually took off. Uh, but the basic cause was excessive transit interference and excess eccentricity. Um, it took us a long while to get to that point. But so the whole compressor casing was redesigned, and the key features in it were, well, certainly putting stiff structures in there, 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 and there to try and keep it round. Um, and yeah, essentially that was it. Uh, and stiffening the whole casing up. That had the benefit of keeping it round and also slowing its response to match that of the disc, because the disc. That time it up. And that, um, that uh, fixed the problem, went into service. So, we had a surge afterwards. But it was about 1976 before that went into service. Now, the turbine blade. Um, I said that early on that we had the extruded blade, and the best we ever got out of that blade was about 3,000 hours. The warranty life on the blade was 3,000 hours, and the airlines hated us. It was just as the just as you're going to get the warranty, it failed. But we finished up paying out a lot of money in warranty because it was it was obviously completely inadequate. In that in the intervening period, we had run a, a high temperature technology program on a, another engine to develop some new turbine technology, and out of that came um, this blade. Which is firstly directionally solidified, cast with internal cooling passages there, compared to the best of the extruded blade, which there. Um, there. This enables to put film cooling at the leading edge, uh, film cooling at the leading edge, much better cooling at the trading edge. You can see the drop of trading edge temperature by nearly 1,000 degrees centigrade. 100 degrees centigrade, which is all 2000. Uh, and drop the leading edge temperature from about uh, 60 to 70 degrees. And that blade went into service and I think went straight through to well in excess of 25,000 hours. In fact, I never saw any spares at all, I expect. <laughs> it was almost too good, but we were determined that we were, we were not going to. Uh, and we also introduced a new nozzle driver at the same time. Now, my, I had left the program at the time this occurred. This is in 1981, 82, when I moved down south to work on helicopter engines. And we had an intershaft set bearing failure. Um, that bearing. Sorry, that bearing, which is the bearing between the LP shaft and the LP shaft and the IP shaft. There's the IP shaft, there's the LP shaft. That failed. Uh, we'd had problems with the bearing since day one because um, it had a tendency to skid. Uh, it's a zero load condition, it had a ten tendency to skid under a zero load condition. But by the time we got to the early 1980s, when I left the program, it seemed pretty pretty okay. There was the occasional one, but it was manageable. Then all of a sudden, we had, I think it was three of them in a row. We never really understood why they suddenly started occurring. Um, yeah. So what was the cause? 
what well, there was the there was metal to metal contact with the very gods location, which then led to rubbing and a fire, and then the shaft overheated and failed to be maintained on the drum. Um, there were a number of modifications introduced in stages, but probably the most important one was this one, which was a fan retention device. But now at the front of the engine, there's the fan shaft coming up through there, there's the fan disc, um, the seal, and then there's this device, which is put there, so that if the fan shift, the bearing fails, it engages at this point and, and, and stops the fan going out. And that was actually run on the test, deliberately failed uh, the test to demonstrate that actually it would hold the fan in the did. Once that was going on, um, a number of changes were made, primarily to increase the oil supply and also increase the spacing uh, and to stiffen up various things. Um, that's increased oil supply and stronger bolts. Um, and then putting the twin objects in the of one another. And then finally, uh, the final solution. The final solution was to put much more space around the bearing, and, and that came in. From there. And that was really the thing. So, that was really the last major change on the 211, by which time its reliability had got pretty good. And the 524, which followed it, uh, had learned an enormous number of lessons and went into service uh, with a much better record, and, and so did the 525. So, this is then how things mapped out. Um, as the 22B, it was then uprated to become the 524, both the Lockheed and also in the Boeing 747, 50,000 pounds of thrust. Then again, um, up to 53,000. I had come back on the program then, I was chief engineer on the D4 at that point, which is the 747, which turned out to be the best engine on the 747 at that point in time. That's the 747 400. Sorry, that's 747, between the 400. Then um, after that, the early 1980, about 1982 or thereabouts, um, Rolls-Royce was not selling many 535s. It was a, a, a depressed area. And General Electric in the United States was not doing particularly well in the CF680 C2. And so a deal was done whereby General Electric would take Oh, sorry, we had not, uh, my apologies. Um, we had by then launched the 525 engine in the 757. Um, and that, that was technically a very good engine, but it wasn't selling very well. And the CF6 wasn't selling very well on the, 7, on the 747. So and we also had a new chairman, um, Bill Duncan came in. And he looked at the business and he thought that Rolls Royce can never survive. Um, we've got to do a deal with General Electric. So he did this deal whereby we took 25% share in the CF680 C2, and um, General Electric took 25% share in the 535. Uh, that was anathema to a number of people in Rolls Royce, particularly Sir Ralph Robbins, and also to Cathay Pacific. Because when the Rolls Royce salesmen went down to try and sell them ATC2s, they got kicked out and said, No, we want you to carry on developing the 211. And I say fortunately, but Sir Bill Duncan passed away and was succeeded by Lord Toombs um, with Sir Alan Robbins as chief executive. And they decided. And the agreement with General Electric did not prevent us from developing the 524. It was just assumed that because it would have been antitrust had it said so. Um, it, it was presumed that we wouldn't because it didn't make sense. But we had a lot of pressure from the airline. So we developed the 524 G and H. We took the technology, we put a lot of new technology into 525, then including a new uh, uh, solid hollow entertainment fan. And um, 
put that technology into fighting for in an age. And at that point in time, General Electric broke off the agreement, not surprisingly, I think we were quite relaxed. And that went into service in the 7400 and also uh, in the 767, although it wasn't too good in the 767, it was a bit heavy. And that was the way to go up there for the uh, So that was the whole 211 story, and that uh, we sold 3,760 engines in total. A lot of them made it by three fires. That was very popular for the package tour industry. So, um, come late 1980s, it was clear that we had to do, we couldn't get any more, the, the 524 really had been taken to its limit. Um, so we started work on a new engine, the, uh, the Trent 700. But at that time, there were three air, air programs going. There was uh, Boeing with the 7, what became the 7, uh, 777, wasn't it? Airbus with the A, a330, A340, A330, and McDonnell Douglas with the MD11. Um, but in fact, we finished up with the Trent 700 in the Airbus aeroplane, and then the, the Boeing 777 got bigger, and so we took the Trent 700, put a new fan on it, um, a much bigger fan, taking up to 90,000 pounds of plus, which is a country and uh, really made a major breakthrough in that market. The Trent 500 was then developed for Airbus for the A340, but that's only had limited life because the four engines really became economic as it was demonstrated you could fly two engines over water for very reliably. And the Trent 900 uh, in the uh, A380, isn't it, which is now in council, but the Trent 1000 and the 787, the Trent XWB in uh, 315, and the Trent 7000, which is now the place of 700 in the A330 year. So that's the Trent family, which now uh, the Trent family has, over, I think, still has over half the market share in the white body engines. So from a uh, very unfortunate beginning to a successful end. Right. Um, some of you know that uh, I've written a book on this story, um, and I do have some copies of the back one. One person's already bought one. Um, it's called The History of the Royal Flight Art to the Turbo Fan Engine. Uh, if anybody else wants copies, if you contact, you want to make a note of that email address, particularly the people who are on the script on Zoom, Mary Moore at RollsWorks.com or Claire Thomas at RollsWorks.com. And request an application form, and then they will arrange to send you one. The cost is thirty pounds. Um, but pe people, if anyone wants one tonight, then just give you the money and the books at the back of the table. I'll sign them for you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about the finger trouble. <laughs> Phil's well, agreed to too close together. Sorry. <laughs> Phil's agreed to answer any questions uh, that you may have. If, if people online want to put questions via chat, I will relay them to Phil. I've got a couple of comments already. Uh, does anybody in the room to go first? Though? Can I just ask one about when they brought Sir Stanley Hooker in, when mm. the, you were in difficulties on the army to elect? Yes. What did he do at that stage? What was the steps he took? Well, he was bought in, first of all, in around about November 1970, um, uh, as a consultant. He and several other old people, because we used to call them Dan's Army. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but then, when uh, post 71, he was made technical director. And what did he do? I think his technical contribution was not, I wouldn't have said it was great. I mean, he, right. yeah, he, yeah. he, he didn't make many decisions. Yeah. He did make one, which I'll come to in a minute. But the thing he did was to rally the troops and raise the morale right. and hold them. So it's a leadership and management. Leadership sure. and management. Yeah. Um, the one thing that he did do, and I just amazed him in fact, fairly early on, um, February, March time, when we were still in deep poo, 
and he started work on the 524, the derivative. Oh, right. And I thought, how do you go to the board when you're in so much trouble mm. and say, I want some money to do a uh, another another mean. development of the engine? Yeah. And I think this is an illustration of the respect that the board had for him. Right, right. So it was his name, his leadership his qualities, his leadership and qualities, and management. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. he did he did make. You never knew with Stanley whether. It was his idea or something else's idea. Yeah. He, he, but, yeah. uh, I mean, he, he, tremendous. Did you work for him then? Did you actually Yeah, I just have to go and see him once a week. Did you? All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, this is when he came in as a consultant. Yeah. Um, and uh, of all the major problems he used there, he used to have this group called Dad's Army, there were about five of them. And yeah, I had to go in and talk to him. Right. Yeah, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Any other questions from my no. colleagues? John. Um, I think the first strike is the high field blade. Yes. This is the thing I think that everybody knows about. Yes. And you've played very little attention to it tonight. Yeah. Um, now, may I ask? It's at the time it happened, I was a person with a limited amount of experience of working on turbines. And I never thought at the time that the incident occurred. Why didn't they think about that earlier? But tonight I'm asking the question, surely was there some misleading information available about the high fill material that allowed you to go? I wouldn't say it was misleading, I think it was inadequate information. <laughs> right, right. Um, I, the, the high fill blade, the high fill material, it was really, it really should have been a, a technology program, not a development yeah. program. That's the fundamental problem. So it um, wasn't an unthought of problem with high fill that it could very briefly under special circumstances which you didn't realise. Nothing strange with that nature. No, I think it was I think it was Because it must have been a terrible shock. Yes, it was. Oh yeah. yeah. But um, the reason I didn't pay too much attention to it was actually we did have the titanium backup oh, program. Yeah, yeah. And the other problems, I mean the press always blames it all on the high foot fan blade. Yeah. Well, it wasn't that big. It was the hot section, the performance, the things I've talked about for the real problems. The high fill, I mean, we ran most of the engines with titanium blades. Yeah. So it wasn't actually holding the program up. Um, the biggest problem is persuading Lockheed that we, yeah, we were going to have to increase the weight and, 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 and the fuel consumption. Although we actually met the fuel consumption in the end by other means. Yeah. No, I, I never worked on the high fill blade. Um, I just remember it. But I mean, from the time we started running the first engines, you, you run them for a few hours and get down there like a shaving brush. <laughs> it was a disaster. I think we've got some questions online. Yeah, there's guess. quite a few online. Uh, it's probably a good time to come because the, the, the first one is on, on the high fill blade. Fred Starr said, "Why? For what was the reason why the high fill blade gave a 2% fuel saving efficiency. What was the factors behind it? Oh, um, yes. The, the, firstly, it didn't have a snubber. And the snubber on the titanium blade sits in the, uh, roughly around Mark 1. Yeah. So about the worst place you could ever put it. So there was quite a big loss there. There were probably some basic aerodynamic benefits because it was a wider core, fewer blades. So it's probably fewer lower surface area, I can't remember now. Um, and you know, what was the other reason? So, no, I think they were the main ones. Basically, yes. a, a, it was a better design. Of better, it was a better aerodynamics. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Following on that from that one, then Fred came on again. Um, Fred did a lot of work with British Gas on British Gas Research. And he's saying that the industrial RB211 was used by British Gas on its pipeline network yes. very extensively. Um, and that used the mnemonic 115 blades. No, it hadn't. The early two of them had a mnemonic 108 blade. Yeah. Oh, it had mnemonic 115 in the IP turbine, but that was a um, an uncalled blade. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so basically, then Fred went on to say, when did Rolls Royce introduce cast blades, and were these made by the firm in Bristol? Well, we introduced them on the 211 in 1979, 1980. Um, no, they're waiting in Derby. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
if I go back to the whole string of questions now, if, if you don't mind, if I just... Sorry, read. can we come back on that? We introduced a different version of the cast blade on the 524 in about 1976. Okay. So, but um, the one I showed here was in 1979. Okay. Um, from Chris Allen, he was asking a, a question about the book, and he said, does the book cover all industrial and marine variants? Um, of the uh, yes, 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 okay. yes, yeah, including the latest on the MP30. Okay, Alan Clayton has, is asking, how is the Trent different from the RB211? Well, part number wise, is probably every part number would be different. Um, architecture is very close, different physical size in some cases. Um, I mean, the tech is the, the 211. That Dash 22 in particular built the technology base, which has then been developed beyond there. Um, but uh, it's got all the fundamental benefits of the three shaft engine. Um, but it, in practice, in part of the terms, it's all different. Um, Richard Monodley asked, with hindsight, what is the top thing you would have done differently to achieve a reliable engine in a short time? Well, the first thing, we would have invested in the technology a lot sooner. <laughs> no doubt about that. Um, in terms of time, well, I think what has happened is, I mean, actually the program there was just about as fast as any program I do today. The difference is they get it right today. <laughs> we didn't. <laughs> um, so the timescales haven't, uh, disappointing to me, because I ran quite a big project when I was there to try and reduce the development timescale. But, what tends to happen is that you use the time available to improve the product rather than to actually try and collapse the time scale. Um, I mean, you could you could argue because this went out to uh, 1980 or so before we fixed it. You could argue this is a 12-year development program whilst the engine was in service. But, um, and perhaps, perhaps the, I think this is the last um, question. On, oh, no, there's a couple more. Um, Neil Mackay asks, and he says, it, perhaps it's a trivial question, what, if anything, does RB stand for? Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I nearly volunteered that at the beginning. Um, it's Rolls Royce Bunnelswick. The original gas turbine, the Whittle engine, was developed at Bunnelswick in Yorkshire. Yeah, I know. And, oh, the, uh, and those engines were designated RB. But it's just stayed RB. I did work. I did work off the bar half with the plant. Yeah. Um, there's a couple. There's a couple more. I'll just scan down for them. Um, Frank James asks, may I ask how the names and numbers of the engine, uh, how the engines, engines arrived at? Well, that's partially covered that one. But it's, I think it's well, really the RB is, train to the, the RB bit is is the thing that's consistent. There isn't an answer to that question because it depends who's in charge on the day, I think. I mean, there's no logic to a lot of the way that either our engines are named or Pratt & Whitney or GE. I mean, Pratt & Whitney went to the extent of the PW7R4G, um, I think it was called, PW... Uh, no, yeah. There isn't a great deal of logic in it. Okay. Um, I just have to, at this point, it's quite difficult to keep scrolling down. Um, John Griffiths asks, which engine suffered a shaft failure whilst on the tent on testbed 39 in about 68 69? I recall the turbine fell off the back, doing considerable damage to the concrete and roof of many escape blades. It sounds like he was actually there. Six, 1969, yeah, 68 69. Maybe it'll be that it'll be that picture I showed. The, the uh, it'll be engine engine 11, I think it was, which is one of the early to dash 22. That's the only engine available at that time. Okay. I'm sure it was that one. Um, and Justin says, very interesting. Many thanks to all of you for organising and especially to, to Phil for his talk. Thank you. That's, that seems That's to be the last of the online questions. Any questions from the audience in here tonight? When you Sorry, John. You'll, you'll come in, John. Well, I don't want to jump on anybody else. No, no, it's fine. You'll come in. So I was rather curious about the story of the uh, uh, engine that surged and the plane rotated, which to me means at the moment when the plane suddenly increased it, in yes, yes, very sharp. Yes. Was this anything to do with gyroscopic? No, no, it was simply that at that point in time, you, the compressor casing 
has grown to full diameter yeah. and is much thinner. And the, the compressor discs happen, so the clearance is at their maximum. That happens at just about the point of rotation. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to the gyroscopic lenses. This experience, you, you're talking about a situation where you get a violent explosive bang. Yeah, yeah, in, yeah, in, yeah. Which is terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> not, not much of hard work. Yeah. It wasn't even an aeroplane, it was nothing up on the ground. Yeah. No, no, that's very good. We have just, just, just on the side there when we go through that photograph. We, um, we needed to, we, 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 we had a a particular modification, doesn't matter what it was. Um, and we bought engines out of the field, surging engines, mm. put them on the test bed, put the modification in, put them on again, and then send them back out as yeah. a means of demonstrating. But we hadn't got that any test bed capacity. So we got it done in a test bed in San, in, um, San Diego uh, PSA. And this test bed was on the ground floor and on the top floor is where all the secretaries were. <laughs> you just imagine what it was like when the engine searched. Oh, now he wants to know it must have been fried. More questions on that? Yeah. It's on that. A, a further comment from uh, Frank Fred Starr. Um, your answer and drawing about the differences between cast and extruded blades and the design changes explain why class blades could not be used with the industrial engines. There were, however, some simple cooling passages um, in the mnemonic 115 blades. I'm just repeating. The, 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 you, you couldn't. I tried to get put cooling passages in 115. It's too hard. They would be 108 blades. But the only reason they weren't used in the industrial engines he's referring to is because we hadn't got them in time. Yeah. Uh, and the later industrial engines ha had the blades that went into the 22B. By 1980 or so, they would have had the same standard of way. Yeah. Well, rather naughty question, not terribly technical, but I worked with someone who worked for Rolls Royce who had the view that, in fact, they knew they were going to go broke a long way out, and that there were two ways they could do it. They could either go broke with an empty order book, and that would be it, or they could go out with a full order book. And the government would have to rescue them. Any observations on that, <laughs> on that old wives' tale? I don't know. Um, certainly, there were a number of people in the company who were against the going ahead with two and eleven because they thought it was going to lead to eventual bankruptcy, which it did. Mm. Um, but and certainly, it's true that if we hadn't had a reasonably good order book, then the government wouldn't have supported it. Why should yeah. they? Um, but I think it's probably a slight exaggeration to say yeah. that uh, they forecast all of that. Mm. I think Bill finds that in as well. Yes, that's probably true. And more on my job. No, it's all gone quiet now. Just to, just check and see if that was. Uh, from the well, can I just ask a question about shafts? Mm. You talk about two shaft engines, three shaft mm. engines, single shaft mm. engines. What's the difference? Why why do you go for a number, different number of shafts? Well, let me start at the beginning. If you have a three shaft engine, a single shaft engine, um, you've got it's really determined by the compressors. Um, in the early days, eight, nine to one pressure ratio was all that people could reasonably do for a single shaft. Now they can do 23, 24, so it's got to go the wrong way. Right. Uh, that, that's the first thing. But then if you want to put a fan on it at a high black mass ratio, yeah, yeah. it's going to be a completely different speed. Right. So you're obliged to have two shafts. Yeah. Yeah. You then have a choice. Do you make up the difference, because the pressure ratios now are up around 60 to 1, mm. do you make up the difference between, you can do about 1.3 or so on the fan, so you take 26 times 1.3, you're up at just over 30 to 1. So you've got another 2 to 1 pressure ratio to put mm. on somewhere. You can either put it on the fat LP shaft, which is what flat would need you to do, right. or you can put it on a third shaft and redistribute the right. other yeah. shafts. Yeah. That, that's that's how you get to where you are. Yeah. And the RB211 was a three, three shaft. Yeah. 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 May I have the observation that you haven't made a point that those three shafts were not running at all at the same speed? Oh, no, 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 sorry. No, They're all varying as well. Yeah. 
and they more or less set them on their own. Oh, they do, yes. Yeah. yeah, the HP shaft on the original engine ran at about 10,000 RPM. The RP shaft is 7,000, and yeah. the fan at 3,500. Yeah, quite a bit. Oh, yes. And they do, as you say, they find their own speeds. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you not hear the audience in any way? Sorry, I missed it. The shafts aren't linked in any way or geared or anything like that? No, I mean, you could gear them, but that's one of the possibilities with when you get a very big back pass ratio, is a gear is a possibility. And in fact, the, current, the latest engine that Rods is working on has got a gear fan on it. Um, geared fans have been used on very small engines, Garrett and you know, Garrett, I think, in particular. Um, but no, it, it, it all comes out to how you want to optimize the aerodynamics. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, Rolls, I think the three shaft engine has been very good for Rolls, but the other side of the story is I don't think they could have done a two shaft engine at that time because they hadn't got a compressor demonstrated with high enough pressure ratio. You know, you need a pressure a pressure ratio of 20 or so to one, and we haven't got one. And there was a recommendation, I know, that we should invest in one, uh, but we didn't until we until we actually merged with Crystal City. We've been working on. So I don't think we could have done a, a two shaft engine if we wanted to. But as it turned out, I think that, that was the three shaft turned out to be a pretty good solution. It was very heavy in the early days. But I think that was more to do with the lack of, um, well, two things. We had to pull our weight on in order to solve the problems. You know, if you're solving them in rapid time, you don't necessarily refine everything. And also, a lot of our lifing techniques were inferior to those that the Americans were using. And so it turned out to be heavy. By the time we got to the Trent, the Trent 800 was lighter than the uh, competitor. So I, I think on weight, it's a, it's a toss up. Okay. David's going to give a vote of thanks. David Byrne, one of our committee members. Yes. I'll come down there and uh, present myself to the camera. Okay. Yeah. First of all, uh, Philip, I uh, don't know how many of our members and guests were following closely the timeline that you got through here, but essentially we're talking about 50 years of aero engine development in how long, John? An hour, an hour and a yeah, hour and 20 minutes. I think that that is an amazing feat, and I would think it leaves quite a quite a lot of us um, well, slightly bemused and maybe a few of us have got headaches trying trying to follow, follow it all. But it's been great that you could be the uh, first person to um, present to 20 seated here and maybe 100 out in the, uh, out in the ether. Um, from the questions that have come through, it would, have, would appear that uh, there is a little bit of knowledge out there and maybe you find found a few of the uh, questions interesting, particularly ones from Fred Starr on British gas mm. and the advent of the RB211 to drive our compressors. And I never understood that far when I was working for the, for the company. But uh, yes, this uh, never ending search for performance that you achieved it occurred to me that you'd embark on something like a 10 to 15 year development program for the engine, faced with tremendous competition out there in America with the advent of the uh, Boeing 707 and 747. Mm -hmm. And then in what was it, 73, you achieved type approval for your, uh, for your Army 211, which must have been a great relief, particularly as you had the major financial problem sure. in 1971, which I think a lot of us will, re a lot of us will remember. Um, but not wanting to 
uh, go on too much. I think what I'd like to say on behalf of uh, the Newcomen Society, Sheff Sheffield branch, on behalf of David and also John, our new, uh, our new president, thank you. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much for giving us a, uh, a very, very uh, and somewhat academic approach to the RV211 and latterly the Trent engines, which are you know, sort of now part of the mainstay mm -hmm. of Rolls Royce Aero and Transition. So I'd like to uh, okay. thank, thank you, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. On a personal basis, I'm, I'm eternally grateful to, to Rolls Royce and Black Peter. You gave one of your suppliers in 1971 such a hard time, Rose Hallgrove, that they refitted a factory over, the, over Christmas. Mm -hmm. And I earned enough money to buy myself a very good car. <laughs> 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 Are we offline now? Not quite, but Not I, quite. Can go, I can go offline. We, this man can edit it. <laughs> Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Fred's yeah. coming with another couple of comments. I know it's been a bit fast for now yeah. because of the uh, cold with the fixing, but thank you for coming along and thank uh, people online as well. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank yes. you. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you, Philip. Well,